Okay, uh, thank you everyone. I think uh, it's uh, sh sharp, three o'clock in Oslo. And um, uh, I would like to uh, welcome you all to uh, this the session, which is uh, actually defined as the non-session and the non-health. Um, it's probably also not directly education, which was just before us, uh, but we have some very interesting uh, speakers and topics for this session, uh, actually four different um, uh, interesting uses of the DHS2 platform uh, in, in sort of non-traditional uh, domains and areas. We're very happy to uh, have uh, Jessica Herrera from uh, uh, Plan International. Uh, she is uh, a digital development officer on youth uh, employment. She will open for us and uh, Later, we will hear from uh, Monica Sigrist from Frontline AIDS and Uwe uh, Wasser from uh, GIZ, uh, as well as Georgina Hill from Pamoja Leo Project. So, uh, if you are ready, Jessica Herrera, please uh, get us started. You can share your screen, I hope. Okay, I'm going to start sharing one second. Okay, can you see my screen? No, it's perfect, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I know we're coming from all parts of the world. I'm uh, really happy to be here. Um, as Nud introduced me, I'm Jessica Herrera. I'm part of Plan International in the Youth Employment Solutions team. And I'm happy to talk for a few minutes about how we're using DHIS2, uh, the tracker app, for uh, youth economic empowerment programs. Um, so first of all, to start um, just a little bit of who we are, uh, Plan International is an international humanitarian child center organization uh, based in 72 countries worldwide. We're divided into donor countries and uh, program countries. Um, then specifically for uh, youth economic empowerment. Uh, our goal is to transition 1 million marginalized and vulnerable young people, especially young women, to decent work by uh, 2020. And then um, we aim to do this by complementing our programs through the digital ecosystem. And this is where, um, how we call in plan DHIS2, we call it Yes Me, the Youth Employment Solutions Monitoring and Evaluation System. This is how it comes together, complementing programs through dig different digital um, products. Um, we have, for example, um, Yes Academy, which is an e-learning platform, and we have TESA, which is a chatbot that connects young people to um, economic opportunities. So through Yes Me is that we're planning on tracking and uh, wrapping everything together. I'm going to show you a few. Um, a video that takes like a minute or two so you can see how the digital ecosystem works together. Let me know if um, the sound comes through. Alma had big dreams, but her dreams were dashed when she was forced to drop out of school, aged just 15. She's not alone. Around the world, more than 600 million young people like her are not in education, employment, or training. Alma heard about Plan International's work to provide young people like her with the knowledge, skills, and confidence they need to make their dreams a reality. Through Plan International, she learned that girls and boys should have equal chances to pursue their own goals, that she could work for an employer, or become an employer herself. But Alma couldn't attend classes in the city. She needed another option. Plan International's Yes Digital Ecosystem offered her one. It provides courses for young people like Alma, which have been developed by experts who understand the country, the market, the opportunities, and what works and what doesn't, so they can learn what, when, and where they want. After completing her course, Alma was ready for the world of work. Plan International helped her find a place at a local company thanks to strong partnerships with the private sector. Alma was lucky, as her placement led to a permanent job. By monitoring Alma's progress every step of the way, 
We are gathering data to enhance and maximize the impact of the programs we offer. With 1 billion young people entering the labor market in the next decade, we need evidence-based, scalable, and effective employment solutions now. Plan International's digital platform provides these solutions. We are working across Africa, Asia, and the Americas so that young people like Alma gain the skills they need to succeed in the world of work. But we can't do it alone. We need more and better partnerships to scale up our programs and create decent job opportunities for everyone. Alma was able to realize her ambitions and live the life she imagined. Every young person deserves that chance. Together, we can make it happen. So um, this is how the digital ecosystem comes together. Uh, we plan to be monitoring and evaluating the, the programs that we create from the beginning all the way till the end to make sure that young people are, are transitioning to, to work and then we, need, we can keep on scaling up our programs. So, oh, sorry, it's starting again. Um, so for the YESME implementation, um, YESME specifically DHIS2, um, in plan. We have implemented across three regions in 10 different countries and we have uh, implemented also in seven different languages. So we've been able to contextualize specifically to each country program making sure that all the way to the sessions that are being implemented the different interventions have been included in YESME so that each um, youth employment or entrepreneurship practitioner can be tracking the progress of each beneficiary that enters the program from the beginning that the young person starts a program with Plan International all the way till the program exit. And we've been uh, implementing different strategies so that we can also track this beneficiary's um, journey even after Plan International. So we can assess the impact of our programs all the way to five years after the intervention. Um, to give you a little snapshot on how um, the tracker program looks for us in one of the projects, um, we have the beneficiary registration. And then um, here's where we collect all the specific data in terms of personal details. Um, if the person's uh, over 18, then we don't need to be necessarily tracking guardian details. Then we collect a baseline to make sure that we can assess what the situation of the young person is at the time. And then by the project exit, we can assess if there was any change in, uh, in the behavior, in the situation, in the conditions. Um, then we go through an enrollment process in which we uh, register this beneficiary in either an employment or entrepreneurship track. And then also we have different activity details, different sessions, different interventions. These are just some examples such as a, a internship, apprenticeship, all the different trainings that are being um, handled, uh, mentoring opportunities. Um, recently we've added also a COVID uh, track to make sure that we can track also the cash advance that we're giving to these entrepreneurs. So um, through this session, session details, we're able to track uh, what young people are staying on, on, on the program and which ones are uh, dropping out. And that way we can track each step of the transition to employment. Then we have the project exit, and then we have the follow-up. Uh, and our aim is to be following up up to five years to so tracking this individual uh, beneficiary. Um, Specifically, the data from YESME, we look at it in two different perspectives. We look at individual level and the program level. For the individual level, we like to um, understand the situation of the beneficiary, identifying patterns, mm -hmm. uh, trying to reduce barriers in terms of getting employment, which is in the end the aim of okay. the program. Trying to see if in different stages of the employment or entrepreneurship program, um, young people are dropping out and if, if, the, if this is something we can avoid in our program and also like trying to match the skills of, of young people um, to the job. And in terms of program overall, um, we uh, aim to achieve more decent work opportunities, maximizing the impact, increasing the quality 
we're able to assess if our indicators are showing that we're transitioning the, the most amount of people from registration all the way to program exit. We're able to transition them to decent work opportunities. And also like with the evidence base that we're able to obtain um, from ESME to facilitate scaling up um, through partnerships and through uh, more funding opportunities. Um, just to highlight some specific challenges, um, the data security and youth safeguarding, since we do collect a lot of sensitive data, um, we, we give waivers um, either to the guardian or to the young person itself. And then um, we're able to uh, limit as much as possible through use of roles uh, in DHIS2 to make sure that the people that have access to the data it's it's very limited and just specifically necessary. Um, COVID-19 has created additional limitations on how we collect data because usually we collect the data in interventions, in trainings, in uh, physical interactions with these beneficiaries, uh, but COVID-19 has put that limitation for us. So there's been um, different strategies either uh, through uh, phone calls or uh, we're in, in the process of prototyping a chatbot through um, Facebook to see if we can collect this data in other ways. Um, we customize per country, which is a challenge in terms of time and resources, having to translate and then just uh, be able to contextualize um, each program to make sure that we're tracking the right um, areas. And um, lastly, youth are very mobile. So um, it's, it's a challenge to be able to uh, monitor these young people after they exit the program because they, they tend to, to move a lot. Um, and in terms of uh, last to close with a, a few of the successes, yes, it has been implemented in 10 countries in three regions. We have over 5,000 um, practitioners using it across the Federation, being able to um, collect data and analyze it through, through the program. Um, it's been implemented in seven languages and we have over 21,000 beneficiaries enrolled in YESME across the, in the last five years. Um, and then I think this closes my session. Thank you so much for the time. And if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Um, let's maybe um, uh, keep questions um, and uh, and ask people to post their questions to the um, to the um, community of practice web uh, forum uh, which I posted a link to in the um, in the um, chat I'll post it again now um, so we'll, we'll do questions at the end but I just want all the presenters to have a chance so please let's proceed to the next presenter, uh, with, um, which is Monica Sigrist, a senior advisor with the, for human rights data systems at Frontline AIDS. Please, Monica, go ahead. Thanks, Knut. Let me just share my screen as well. Mm. All right, is that looking good from your end? Yes. Great. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone from Brighton in the United Kingdom. Bonjour à tous les francophones aussi. My name is Monica Sigrist, and I'm a senior advisor, human rights data systems at Frontline AIDS, and I will be talking to you for the next ten minutes about Frontline, how Frontline AIDS is using DHIS2 to monitor and respond to human rights abuses. Um, and violations using rights evidence action or react for short. So just to tell you a bit about um, who we are. So we're an international NGO working on the front line of the world's response to HIV and AIDS for about 27 years now, working with marginalized people who are denied HIV prevention and treatment simply because of who they are and where they live. So we work with communities in more than 40 countries, taking local, national, and global action on HIV health and human rights. Um, so together with 
partners on the front line, we work to break down the social, political, and legal barriers that marginalized people face. So we were seeing increasing stigma and discrimination and criminalization of people living with HIV and other marginalized populations in many places. And in response, we developed rights evidence action, so REACT, what I'll be saying for short, which is a community-based human rights monitoring and response system. So what REACT does is that it enables civil society organizations to document data about human rights violations experienced by individuals in the communities. So it provides and refers these individuals to services, um, whether legal or health or other public services, and then uses this data to inform quality human rights-based HIV programming, as well as policy and advocacy at national, regional, and global levels. Um, and then this work is supported on the information management side by DHIS2 using a tracker program. So this schematic illustrates in a nutshell the REACT program a little bit. So I'm going to talk you through um, this diagram. On the response side, this is illustrated by the green arrows. So this is all about um, a reactor, which is a person we've trained on the REACT methodology, uh, meeting with a client to take down their notes and listen to their testimony and then provide or refer them to services or a human rights program or an emergency response fund. And then the pink arrows illustrate the monitoring aspect, which is about documenting this information in an information management system, which is DHIS2 for us, um, which allows for the monitoring and analyzing of human rights data to inform programming, influence decision makers, evidence for advocacy, um, to resource human rights programs. So REACT as a system has been used by Frontline Aid since 2014, but it was only in December 2019 when we moved REACT data entry into the DHIS2 platform. So we have about, um, I guess, 10 months of data now for REACT within DHIS2. So just to get a bit DHIS2 y on, on this, the React Data Collection tool is based on a generic template, which is customized for each country implementing React based on things like the national human rights context and the population groups that the program is working with and the types of programming, whether it's a service delivery program or an advocacy program. And then from the frontline AIDS perspective, we also want to review the data collected at a global level across the countries implementing REACT. So in order to do this, the first thing we realized is that we needed to create a single program, so a single tracker program, as analytic functions cannot compare data between um, programs. So we built one tracker program um, and then used program rules and org unit groups to hide um, things so that end user only sees the questions in the form that are relevant to them. Um, the management of REACT information has been devised in accordance with the general data protection regulation of the EU. So we limit as much as possible the need to document personal information and use things such as unique identification codes um, to track clients in the system. So this is different from the auto-generated ones that DHIS2 can do for you because it's based on individual characteristics um, of the person to make it uh, more easily um, retrievable, like if the client forgets their code. Um, however, we still wanted it to be system generated in a sense to minimize data entry error. So I'll just show you a very quick video. There's no sound, so don't worry if you don't hear anything about how that works. Um, pay attention to this field, which says, well, this is the Portuguese version, um, just how it populates based on questions like, what is the initial of your first name? What is the initial of your last name? Which region of Mozambique uh, are you from? Date of birth and so on. And then it generates this code, um, which we then use to track the individual. So almost identical to an auto-generated one, but slightly different as well. 
Um, then case information. Um, this is an example one. It's not a real case, so don't worry. <laughs> um, just for demonstration purposes, where the actual details, um, the testimony is documented about what the client has experienced. And then this is a repeatable program stage, which means that um, each client has a record and every time they return to a reactor, uh, the reactor will add cases to that client's record. So over time, you have a collection of incidents, of human rights incidents a single individual has experienced and maybe you can relate it to changes in the human rights context or laws or policies and see how that changes, which is a great feature of Tracker, right? So longitudinal data. Um, then moving on to the analytics side, it's very important to us that data documented by reactors in DHIS2 is used um, by themselves as well as civil society organizations to inform quality human rights based HIV programming and to use that data um, as evidence for policy and advocacy. Um, so to help in this, we developed these reactor dashboards as a starting point for reactors to start thinking about what they want to analyze. Um, just wanted to highlight the mapping functionality in particular because we did something a little bit different with this. We wanted to highlight hotspot areas within a country where we're seeing a high concentration of human rights abuses and violations. However, for safety and confidentiality reasons, we didn't want to pinpoint um, areas on a map, but rather just sort of show it at a higher like district or province level. Um, this functionality was not available at the time in terms of linking an organization unit value type data element to the maps app. So this is actually a custom map solution that uh, we built with support from BAO systems, but it's working very nicely, as you can see. Um, I'm just going to play again a short video clip just to show you what sort of standard React dashboard looks like um, on the analytics side. So as you can see, we use a mixture of quantitative tables and infographics, and we track things such as the profile of the client, the types of perpetrators, the types of incidents, and then what services were provided or referred. And this, of course, can be further integrate, interrogated by partners um, to identify links between these two different or various different elements. So also to talk about some of the challenges, data, and, data safety and security. Um, is always a concern with users in the system in terms of it's understandable because of the sensitive nature of human rights related information. Um, however, uh, this is usually more a perception of security as a challenge rather than our actual experience. So users are worried about it, but as I have demonstrated, we have built in some data confidentiality features such as the use of unique identification codes to minimize documenting personal information. Um, we make use of informed consent forms as well if you know, any personal information is going to be documented. Um, user roles to limit you know, what different users can see. Um, we also make use of various DHIS2 features such as two-factor authentication, um, obviously things like session timeouts um, to help with that. And usually once I partners think about this in relation to what they're using, what they were initially using, so paper-based methods or other tools like Excel, we've normally won them over by the end of the training in terms of safety and security. And managing complexity is a big one because we use program rules and organization unit groups to customize a base template for different organizations in different countries. We have hundreds of program rules to manage now and every new country that comes on board and we customize things for them we have to make sure that it doesn't have any impact on you know the data collection forms of the previous countries and users that are using it so just something that's ongoing obviously in this context can't have a presentation without talking about COVID-19 so 
Uh, in relation to COVID-19, we were no longer able to deliver our face-to-face -face React trainings um, on the React methodology to partners. And obviously, we saw a reduction in program activities as well, um, which given that we just only launched in December 2019, we were a bit worried about how partners would be able to um, continue programming activities. And then lastly, around languages. So we do work in some obscure countries, perhaps such as in Ukraine and in Georgia, and the interface languages um, did not exist yet for DHIS2. Um, successes, so we're currently implementing React in eight countries using DHIS2 and with six more in the pipeline. This implementation has been implementation, sorry, has been staggered. So it, they didn't all join in December 2019. And in fact, the last country was Uganda, which was only last month, I think. So we've got yeah, that happening. It is also encouraging for us to see that partners are managing to actively use React and DHS, DHIS2, even in the context of COVID-19. So we've got about a thousand clients and cases documented. Um, which is great because we've seen that COVID has exacerbated a lot of human rights um, situations. So it's something that partners can still use uh, to document this. Uh, we've also been working a lot with um, UIO and the language, the translation database and have made significant contributions to the Ukrainian interface language. Uh, so if any of you are working in Ukraine, a lot of that is frontline aids, um, the language. Then we've also translated um, React and DHIS2 into six database languages. This is a bit easier because obviously you can control this. Um, so it's allowing for data co collection in all these languages, which is great as well. Um, just to close off, I wanted to give one example to show how human rights data collected using React is being turned into evidence. So this is an example from the Middle East and North Africa region. Um, we supported an organization called Mena Rosa to train focal points in the countries that they work in on React to document the experience of gender-based violence of women living with HIV. And then React was used to identify and drive responses and to raise visibility of the issue and influence decision makers. Um, so if you want to read more about this, um, and if you Google Menarosa and Silent Stories, it'll be the first thing that comes up uh, if you're interested to see what that looks like. Um, here is a quote um, from one of our um, React users. And it just illustrates how React is a tool to arm activists and human rights defenders to continue to make the necessary advocacy noises and arm themselves with evidence, which is now the panacea for any advocacy and development initiative. And yeah, that's all for me. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Monica. Very interesting uh, two presentations we've seen so far. Um, uh, some similarities and, 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 and a lot of innovation as well, uh, even in terms of language. So thanks. Uh, I'll hand right over to Uwe, who is um, working on uh, health insurance and actually universal health coverage. So it's sort of health, but it's, it's the financial bit. So Uwe, the floor is yours. Uh, please stop sharing, um, Monica, and over start sharing. Yeah, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Good. Um, yeah, thank you, Knut. Um, thanks for having us. Um, as you mentioned, we are working in health insurance, uh, so non-health is not really very correct. Uh, you don't get rid of this. Let me start by introducing the team. Actually, this was planned as a shared presentation, um, but since we are offline for technical reason, I'll just uh, do it as the only one. Um, and actually, I'm the one who has done the least work on this. So the people you see on the slides uh, right now 
Yogita Saurav uh, from HISP India and my direct colleague Saurav uh, from GIZ. Um, they have done most of the work of it and uh, all the credits go to them. They are in the community of practice. Uh, Knut has shared the link already. So if you have questions during the presentation, they will be ready to answer and they will be the competent ones. Uh, what is Open IMIS? Um, we call it Open IMIS with an E, um, although uh, you might want to spell it Open IMIS, but we have voted we want to call it Open IMIS because in Kiswahili you would also read it Open IMIS, of course. Uh, it's a software for managing health insurance schemes, but also other health financing schemes uh, like voucher systems or um, capitation systems. Um, and it's an open source product. It's a global good that is in the catalog from Digital Square listed as a global good for health insurance operations. Um, and the aim is of course to contribute to the improvement of the universal health coverage uh, worldwide. We have uh, several live up and running productive implementations. Um, most of them in Africa, Tanzania started, uh, then it was migrated to Nepal where it is running the national health insurance scheme now. Um, we have a few pilots coming up. This is changing a lot. So I'm not even very sure whether this list is up to date. We have a pilot coming up in Djibouti. They are working on this uh, for the health insurance there, Zandibar for health insurance scheme and um, also in Gambia there uh, for financial transactions. And then we have a country assessment in a number of countries um, and we will have a new catalytic fund starting this year that will give us the opportunity to also support certain implementations if an organization decides to go for open EMIS. Um, we could uh, have a bit of budget to um, support that process and uh, you just have to approach us. Okay, that is Open IMIS, the software itself. I'm slowly bridging over to DHIS2 now because um, those are our main workflows and business processes that we are supporting. Enrollment, uh, then the claiming process, uh, claim entry process, uh, verification of insurance status, when the patient seeks service in the hospital and then the claims management where the hospital sends a claim to the insurer and the insurer is doing the review and um, adjudication of the claims. So the final stage reporting and monitoring is um, a module that we decided to build on DHIS2. We didn't want to do our own software developments, just in the sense of the OpenHIE software architecture. Um, you might have heard of OpenHIE. I'm not going to explain it here. If you don't know it, please Google it. And um, if you work in health, this is a very important um, architectural framework. We, from the beginning, we said we want to integrate into that. We want to be part of it. And um, we set up projects to have open MS talk to um, like BAMNI open MRS and also DHIS2. So um, yeah, basically when you want to report on insurance data from open MS, um, you can export them to DHIS2. There was a dashboard that was created uh, like on beneficiary reporting, how many people are insured, what's the coverage in uh, certain regions. So we have about 25 indicators, um, claims, um, the number of claims, the amount of money that was claimed, that's about 50 indicators and then a few uh, indicators on operations and like uh, the processing times in the insurance systems. Uh, how long does it take for a claim to get rejected or paid? Um, ba basically, it's an um, installation of open image in the organization. Uh, we have objects from that database in open image that we push through fire interfaces. FHIR is a standard uh, internationally renowned on um, specific uh, data exchange formats. And um, through those standard interfaces, this DHIS2 application is able to pull data on a nightly basis, for example, into tracker program um, entities. And then the analytics can be done uh, over here on the DHIS2 side. 
Um, normally, this installation would not be in the national um, implementation uh, that you use for HMIS. Uh, normally, that would be within an insurance organization um, as the same on the same server infrastructure as you would have open MS. Uh, technically, in the tracker, um, we, of course, we are using data elements there, and uh, for us, it was important to have the technical names specifically mapped to fire resources. So if there is a, like claims response as a resource and fire and the attribute there is called process node, what we in OpenMS would call claim status. So here we are compatible to fire. And um, if you want to use um, the dashboards with another insurance management systems, a lot of insurance companies worldwide have their homegrown systems. Um, then you could, uh, you have, let's say that way you have pretty good chances to use the dashboard um, because of the standards. Technology framework for the adapter, that thing that is pulling data from OpenMS and pushing it into DHIS2, uh, that's a piece of software built on Java. And um, basically it is like doing the data exchange you can schedule it in a cron, cron drop, like every 24 hours, normally you would do that at night. And it will also do the metadata sync, for example, the health facilities and the location before pulling in new data. Of course, if you have different definitions of health facilities in the source system, then you have in the reporting system, then the whole thing will not work. So you have to do that first. Um, let me give you a few links. Uh, of course, you can download the presentation um, on the sketch uh, uh, page for this session, um, and then you can click on it. Um, this is a link to the page that explains to you how to access the demo instance, which is online right now. Then we have a wiki page just summarizing most of the resources and the documentation in our OpenMS wiki. Um, you can download the dashboard configurations uh, for import into, it, into DHIS2 um, from a GitHub repository and also the adapter. The adapter is a bit um, not yet final, so please be careful with that. Um, not yet pro uh, for productive use. Outlook for the next phase or the next coming month, uh, there's a rollout project starting for the dashboard in Nepal now. It will also be HISP India now taking the developments and uh, like really verifying it in the field. At the same time, we are looking at the dashboard closely uh, to see whether and how to adapt it for Tanzania. Um, and yeah, then a question into the room, like uh, especially at Knud, who is, who is experienced with the WHO packages. Um, of course, uh, we want to make this available for as a global good, just like OpenMS. And um, the question would be that we would need some guidance on how to package this further so it can maybe eventually become part of the uh, official DHIS2 content packages um, that could be distributed to other insurances as well. Uh, I think that's it, the normal partner page. Some of them are throwing money at us, so we should mention them, Swiss, um, the Swiss uh, Development Cooperation and the German Ministry of Development Cooperation mainly. And that was it. Thank you for your interest. Um, please feel free to ask your questions to my colleagues. Thank you uh, very much, Uwe. That's really, uh, really interesting. And uh, just to actually uh, respond to your your um, your um, request for packaging, now we would very much like to work with you on on how this can be uh, standardized and offered as 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 a resource. Uh, so yes, we started with WHO, and WHO is is the main focus for developing content packages, but um, but we we really do want to do th this as a more general process, um, also certainly outside of health. So even in education, we also want to offer packages. So so yes, let's continue that uh, discussion on how to 
uh, how to make all of this great work uh, available uh, more broadly. Also very impressed by your simultaneous AI, AI uh, French translation. Um, that's, that's very nice. Um, Maybe not if you're a native speaker, then you might find it ridiculous. <laughs> So yeah, well, um, but at least uh, it, it looks impressive to me, not a native speaker. Uh, so uh, let's um, uh, again uh, ask for people to pose questions in the um, in the community of practice. We might also have a bit of time uh, at at the end, but uh, let's move on now to the last presentation, uh, which will be by Georgina Harris Hill, who is a co-founder of Pamoja Leo in uh, Tanzania. So, um, Uwe, please uh, stop sharing your screen and, uh, and uh, Georgina can start sharing. Thank you. Let me just... Um, oh, one second, let me just try and get it up. Can you see it? We can, yes, now, yes. Or oh, it's not... One second, let me get to the beginning. So, okay, so my name is Georgina. Um, I am the founder of Promoduleo UK and I'm the director at Promoduleo Tanzania. And I'm just going to be talking today about the use of DHIS2 in a social welfare setting about the system, uh, the Tanzanian Child Services System, which is a data capture and case management system for childcare institutions, or more generally known as orphanages. So Pamojaleo um, is a small charity based in uh, Tanga, Tanzania, um, and our main work is around transforming care for orphaned and vulnerable children. We work to create alternative care solutions um, so both preventative so to prevent children from falling out of their family alternative family-based care solutions such as kinship care and foster care and then also working to get children in institutional forms of care such as orphanages back into family-based care another one of the big areas of work that we focus on is developing tools and programs to ensure accountability towards children who are not living in family-based settings just to expand upon the problem that we've gone about solving, um, more than 8,000 children live in children's uh, homes within Tanzania, about 8 million children worldwide do. And according to LUMOS and a number of the other large um, NGOs that monitor this issue, approximately 80% of the children residing in orphanage care or childcare institutions are not in fact or orphans, contrary to popular belief. So there's a real knowledge gap about why they are there, how they got there and who they are. And for too long it's been assumed and therefore policy and programming has not been aligned and programming has been missing the needs of these children. Up until um, development of the solution, the government was not collecting, collecting any form of digital data and reports were manually written and only including things like name, age and gender of the child. Tanzania, like many other countries, majority of the orphanages or child care institutions in the country are privately run by small charitable organisations. And in turn, what we find is there's very low compliance with the laws, contrary to the fact that Tanzania has fantastic laws uh, governing this issue in the Law of the Child Act 2009. And I think also more importantly to, to, to highlight is that children residing in childcare institutions are at higher risk of all forms of abuse. There is a lot of focus uh, recently as particularly in most countries are starting to um, become aware and talking about the risks of orphanage trafficking. And importantly also to mention is that the UN General Assembly in 2019 was the first time that all member states officially recognised the damage and the harm that childcare institutions cause for children and made an official commitment to transition away from institutional forms of care and start to invest more in family based care. But the, big, the second end of the problem is we really don't know and we still don't know globally what are the issues that the children are facing? Why are they there and how can we better serve their needs? So why do we need a data solution? Children who reside, as I said before, in childcare institutions, we don't really know much about them, particularly in Tanzania. And I can say that that um, is the case for a lot of the rest of East Africa. And data informs programming. 
So without the right data, we don't know which kind of problems we need to be solving to ensure that these children can be trans transitioned back into the family. And I can give an example of that. When we started looking at the data that we collected through the use of the TCSS system, we started to realize that the major reason that children under the age of one were entering into um, orphanage care was maternal death. So we were able to look at different age demographics and different triggers that were causing them to enter. And through that, we were able to work on developing a program that addressed that problem at family level. And this year in our region, we've had, so in our district, we've had no child under one enter um, the care system because they've been able to be uh, helped through alternative programming. The other reason for a data solution is that um, there's lots of great laws, policy and um, the create, creations of this children's rights framework, but data allows us to translate these into measurable indicators and reduce corruption that is very evident in the system and increase levels of accountability. Our journey, as I said before, we were, we were a very small charity and we started off with a piece of paper and a pen. Um, we walked around and individually um, interviewed all the child in, children in our district who were residing in a childcare institution. We then transitioned that into a Microsoft Access database and with that we went to the ministry. When we arrived they said great, uh, we were able to produce some really shocking figures and highlight issues that for a long time had been assumed but never known. And many of these issues excitingly were solvable, but now we had the data to prove it. But then came up the challenge that Microsoft Access really wasn't gonna work if this program was to be scaled in any way. And that's where DHIS2 came in. In Tanzania, as many of you may know, it's already being used to monitor health outcomes. There's a lot of uh, trust and um, acceptance in the model. So we looked at creating, working with a developer in Zanzibar to create a um, Android app and web tracker uh, system. What does it do? So at the beginning of the um, TCSS system, we have a aggregate data collection where we capture all the information of why a child is entering into care. And we get that really great ability to analyze the data of what is, where these children are coming from and what the cause of entry. We're able to then use uh, follow-up interviews, so capture the children as they are residing in these homes. We created different follow-up um, timeline of events so we can start to track things like family visiting, education and health. We then, as part of the case management um, system, we added the ability to create exit strategies and each exit strategy now comes with an, um, an action plan that's required, which is really important for increasing accountability and ensuring more compliance with the legal frameworks. We're also able as part of this case management timeline to be if a case um, an exit strategy fails we can uh, show that it fails and then create a new one so it really gives us that history of a child's experience whilst they're in the care system. And this is really important because children often spend many years in orphanages and staff turnover meant that historically this data and this information about the child themselves was being lost. And not only for a case planning and, and, and to be able to um, help the children in the way that is child centered, is this data important, but also children have the right to know their story and their history. And so actually through this, we're able to keep a track and really great knowledge about where children come from and why they're there. Uh, another feature that we added in was the ability to create red flags. So things such as a child running away, or if a child's case hasn't been um, had any updates to it for six months. In the uh, care system as well, particularly in Tanzania, that they, this was an issue. Children were being left in orphanages for years at a time and no updates were being made. So by doing this and creating the bespoke dashboards, to each layer of social welfare. They're able to increase the accountability structures. And if a red flag goes onto the system, we're able to create a way that um, certain tiers of social workers have to follow up on these issues. So that uh, creating accountability structures for children is so important. 
And lastly, we worked on the referral mechanism. So within that we can refer to other stakeholders um, who need to be um, involved in the case planning for children. So for example, if the child is looking to be going into kinship care with a grandma and the grandma needs access to poverty reduction services, we're able to, within the system, generate these referrals in a way that is allowing um, increased connectivity and increased accountability and just broadening that circle and bringing in other NGO stakeholders that previously hadn't actually um, explored providing services to children within institutions as I said at the beginning many often assume that they're there because they have no family and so through this data we're able to actually bring in a wider network of people and through the referral mechanism allow them to see that these are actually children that need their services too. The successes so far, we've uh, captured all the children within the region um, into the um, database. We've hosted a training for social welfare officers on how to use uh, the system and given out um, tablets for them to go out into the field and start tracking in real time um, children's uh, planning cases and also as they enter into the children's home. We have connected with the Ministry of Social Welfare who are monitoring the project as well as a case study um, and they are really excited. We've got really great feedback as well from them about how it is working and the big thing that we're really excited about is we're seeing change in practice. We're seeing less children enter, more children going into families and this is where we are really a big advocate for data-based solutions to um, this problem. We're also seeing things such as more children now are being known to the ministry level that need to be adopted or fostered. That data previously was not able to be exchanged so easily and therefore children were being left in situations that are not ideal for their development and so through data we're able to create that communication pathways to really start to change practice and see a huge improvement in the way that case management occurs for children residing in um, childcare institutions. Future plans, so through the um, use of the data um, we were able to identify two key areas that were really um, in non-compliance with the law. One of them was that children were being illegally and irregularly referred into the care system. And so addressing issues like orphanage trafficking, we were able to design key interventions and trainings to rectify that issue. And the other one being that um, over 90% of children did not have an established exit strategy. And so by the end of 2020, our goal is that all children will have an exit strategy created. And that is able to be monitored by the various levels of government to see the number of strategies created and what they are so that we can start planning for those children. Um, we still have some of the social workers in rural areas that we would like to train as well on in using the tablets and providing them with a tablet and we hope to be able to do that by the end of the year. And we're really excited about the potential of rolling this out nationwide. As far as we're aware, we, there is no other um, system, no, nobody else using DHIS2 to monitor children in orphanage care or childcare institutions. And we really believe that although this is not an area that has got a huge amount of global attention, it is so important because these children really need to be seen and they need to be heard. Thank you for listening to me. I welcome any questions. And I just wanted to reiterate the point that through um, the use of DHIS2, we are really able to amplify the voices of children that were previously ignored. We now know their issues better, we're serving them better, and we're changing practice through the use of this system. So thank you very much, and I welcome any questions. Thank you so much, Georgina. That's very inspiring, um, certainly for people who do <laughs> work on the technical side to see, to see that it's actually the data is actually really um, useful for for uh, for this, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have very much time. I know I know there are um, uh, two sessions coming up in just five minutes. One on server management, very technical, and for everyone else, there's about fourteen different additional in interesting use cases that will be presented in the so-called use case bazaar. But um, I, think, I think we've seen some very, very nice presentations today. I hope this 
is not just of inspiration, but it uh, can lead to some um, further uh, discussion in the community and, and cross fertilization between. But maybe we can take one or two questions if you want to put it in the chat. I, I see a lot of applause in the chat. Um, or, uh, of course, continue in the community of practice. Um, any burning questions before, for any of the presenters before we wrap up? Maybe people are just too overwhelmed. Um, there was one question uh, that has been answered, uh, I see, on the community of practice. Uh, well, I do hope you will all take this uh, opportunity to um, to to forge new uh, relationships, and you've you've seen uh, interesting uh, ways of using the platform. Um, it's also interesting to hear that people had issues with cross uh, program anal analytics, which um, which we are actually putting as a high priority for future releases. But, but it seems like all, all of you have been able to do quite a lot with what's already there. So thank you very much to the presenters, uh, Jessica, uh, Uwe, um, Georgina, and Monica. And uh, I'm very grateful. We'll post this session also as a YouTube video on the YouTube channel. Thanks, everyone. And um, see you in the next sessions. <laughs>